Okay, so we're going to talk about perforated eardrums first of all. Um, so, panel, um, Susan, five-year-old child um, who might have had a grommet at some stage when it was younger, now uh, is fit and well but getting ear infections and they've got a nice perforation of the left eardrum. Uh, other ear is normal and the hearing is, you know, pretty much normal. So how would you manage this one? So I think I, I mean, he's a five-year-old still quite small to consider mm -hmm. surgery, I think. So I would be asking him to keep the ear dry, uh, prescribe a swim plug so it's custom made, so that makes it easier. And if they do get infections, then I tend to use ciprofloxacin and dexamethasone drops because that's safe with a perforation. Yeah. Um, and then wait to tell, because most likely it will heal on its own. Okay. If it doesn't, then consider myringoplasty. How, how likely is that to heal, do you think? I find it varies. I mean, because um, quite often, it's not uncommon to get a perforation after a grommet. So a fair few of them will heal. The, yeah. Clearly, the bigger the perforation, then the more of a difficulty that would be, but it's, it, it's still quite small. I think there's a good chance it will heal. Okay. Um, so Sorry. one of my colleagues, uh, Dan, doesn't really seem to have an age limit on mending perforations. Does anybody else in the panel draw a line at a specific age? Adrian, for example? Not really. Um, the, the question is, is uh, how much trouble is the perforation causing? And if, the, if it's not causing any trouble, then there's no rush to repair it. Uh, and yeah. I think there is a possibility that uh, over the age of five or over the age of seven, or perhaps waiting to the age of 10, that middle ear function has a better chance of being normal. Yeah. Uh, I always used to wait uh, till, till the age of about 10 until yeah. um, the, the, the um, mesh analysis from Birmingham, which said age didn't make any difference and the status of the contralateral ear was more important. But uh, of course, um, that itself is dependent on age to some extent. So yeah. if there's no rush, if there's no indication, you don't have to repair a hole just because it's there. Uh, I would, um, like uh, Susan said, I would wait on this one. Okay, Will. Um say that this child was getting a lot of infections um what would you do about it then you know their parents were kind of leaning on you to do something so i think generally if you have a dry perforation it's very reasonable to wait and my practice is wait till about 10 oh, okay. and look, looking at also at the other ear yeah. so if the other is if the other ear is glue free yeah and it's not having problems um then that's a, a positive factor um, yeah. the, other, the other aspect is that if you wait till 10, you have a child who can actually help you. They will lie still to have their packing taken out. You don't have to go back to theatre to, to actually remove all you put in. Hmm. Um, but if the situation is changing, the other ear becomes more pertinent. Because at five, if they've got a completely glue-free other ear and no acute hepatitis media on a regular basis, then you can start to think about it. If they've got either glue or a current AOM in the other side, then if you graph this, they are they may well get glue back or yeah. they'll reperforate. Mm. And so sometimes you've got to tough it out. However, if the other ear is disease free, it's looking good, they're getting lots of infections in this ear, then you start to think, shall I do something? Okay. Now, 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 the, the, the worry I would have with this ear is the meringitis. If you look at that ear carefully, you've got a meringitic state uh, area. You can see uh, posteriorly between the perforation and the tympanosclerosis, it's not normal drum. It's meringitic drum. And sometimes with these posterior post grommets in um, uh, perforations, you get the, the middle ear mucosa either invading or not, or the, the epithelium not healing, and you get this big meringitic segment. And if you look at it, you can see there's a circle of meringitis asymmetrically more posteriorly. And if you don't take that off, they will actually heal with meringitis. And then you'll have one of these nasty perforations, these, these intact drums, but with a meringitic segment. Okay. So I would be looking to treat this heavily to see if I could change that meringitis. If that meringitis doesn't change, then you're looking at really taking off possibly 50% of the drum to actually get fresh edges. And of course, the bigger hole you have, it is possible it won't heal so well. So I would be, I would be wary of this ear in terms of surgery 
and I'd want to get as good as I could before mm. I operated. Okay. I suppose, Mike, I suppose one exception to the rule, we probably all have um, a number of children who have constant, frequent odorrhea, tympanosclerosis of the drum, and then very suddenly on a waiting list for a long time, they get tympanosclerosis of the chain and they get this dramatic conductive hearing loss. Okay. So with long waiting lists and that sort of thing, you just want to be mindful. You don't leave a child uh, running every month uh, and not without the surgeon knowing about it or... Uh, that's the sort of one yeah. you might want to do urgently and not leave for years. Keith, say that you um, decided to bite the bullet and you know, you've treated it with some topical steroids and it's looking less meringetic. The other ear is virgin, perfect hearing, and the parents are desperate for an operation. If you decided to bite the bullet, what surgical approach would you take to that? Uh, it'd be very suitable for a little uh, transcanal butterfly graft, a little cartilage um, graft. Do you do um, lots of those? That, that's what I would do. That'd be my first yeah. technique. As long as you're not butting on, if you're right on the umbo, it's sometimes a little, um, doesn't sit very nicely. Okay. But as long as it, it doesn't turn into a huge perforation once you're fresh in the edges. Yeah, yeah quite. Okay, excellent. I'll move on. So we've already covered that. What's the youngest age? Keith, do you have a sort of youngest age for moringoplasty? Or? Yeah, when I was, a, my registrar interview was uh, age 10, where it was what the, the paper said years ago. Mm. Mm. And now it depends how symptomatic the child is. Yeah. So it's my lowest. We've had a couple of two or three year olds with uh, mm -hmm. um, MBL deficiency, syndromic chronic immunodeficiency. We've tried everything and we just can't get the ear to settle and we bite the bullet and it, it, it usually, yeah. it usually works. Go for it. Okay. Excellent. Um, just got sorry, Mike. Yeah. Susan. Yeah. Um, we talked about myringitis. What's the panel's... Uh, do, you, do we have tips on how to treat the myringitis? So, that's a <laughs> yeah, well, you brought it up. <laughs> um, I would have to say, myringitis is the thing I find most difficult to notice. Yes. Um, because it's often not of your making. Sometimes it is of your making. Um, and to actually try and settle it down is really difficult. So, so I would have to say, for me, it's the biggest problem I face um, post-operatively, because usually the drum will heal. You, you, you usually get a healed drum, but if Mary and Geyser starts, you have this healed drum with this wet segment, and they always, every, every time they get a cold, they get a little bit of wetness in their ear, and they get a bit of irritation. So what do I do? I, I try a course of silo drops, then I will give them betanazole for another two weeks after that to try and see if you can get any improvement. I'll then put on trial cortisol ointment and I'll try and cover it and leave it like that. If it's still not working, I'll use a defocused KTP laser and I'll try and burn off the meringetic segment, leaving the intermediate or inner layer to see if you can get rehealing with um, squamous epithelium. Although the risk is actually sometimes the drum breaks down when you do that. And then the other option is to go back in and excise the entire meringetic area but the trouble is you can get meringitis coming back. So I, 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 I would love to have a good cure for meringitis. Okay. Yes, it's my experience that it, you, 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 my, I mean, I'm not an otologist, but I give them steroid drops and it sort of gets a bit better and it seems to come back again. Um, quite an awful. Right, let's move along a little bit. Um, Mike, there was a question actually from somebody yeah. about... Um, uh, operating on a discharging ear that's not responding to treatment. Okay. You want to take that now? or Yes, let's take it, it now. Um, so I'm going to bing, 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 go forwards a little bit. Um, infected one that's discharging. So what are you going to do here then, Adrian? Um, what did you start? I, well, so I would uh, use drops in much the same way that uh, Susan uh, had said to use separate. Um, we have ciprofloxin dexamethasone drops here. Uh, to try and calm it down. Uh, my preference, or uh, there is the when, when you mentioned that, Susan, I, it remind it made me think of uh, work which has been done in a couple of centres in in the US, showing that any time you apply Ciprodex drops to the ear, there's a risk that the the, the well, you're more likely to have a perforation afterwards. It's been shown if you put the drops in at the time of grommet insertion, you're more likely to have the perforation when the grommets come out. And and animal model studies show that the drum doesn't heal so well with 
ciprofloxacin or dexamethasone or even worse, a combination of both. Um, we sort of looked at that question ourselves retrospectively and it doesn't seem to make much difference, but it, I think it's something to be mindful of that maybe that combination of drugs isn't good for healing of the eardrum. Um, but in the absence of anything better, that's still what I would use in, in, at the moment. Uh, and so I would try and get it to settle down. But if it didn't, um, as the question implies, uh, I would still go ahead anyway. And, and interestingly, that um, meta-analysis that I referred to from Chris Colson and colleagues in Birmingham showed that, uh, and I think other, you know, the, there was another review as well, showed that uh, the success of repairing a just in a, an actively inflamed ear is better than in a uh, in a dry ear. So although it's a bit of a pain having to operate on an ear like this because it bleeds and you can't see so well, um, I'm not sure that it's a a reason to avoid surgery. In fact, it may be the indication for surgery. Okay, right. Um, Susan, what do you think? Yes, I would. I would. I mean, I would do the same. I would. I wouldn't operate if the patient comes in. So. So certainly I'd try the drops uh, to see if I could settle the infection before, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't delay surgery if there were, the problem is if you've got a patient who has multiple infections and repeated infections, then often surgery is hopefully the solution to the problem. Um, and I think you just have to, to warn them about that. I mean, I think, I think I'm a little bit more cautious if they have an overall infection, you know, if they're febrile or they have something else going on, as opposed to an active discharge where the patient's fine. Um, okay. Treat it as, as best as possible. I think there is some, you know, we, we used to have this idea of, well, do they need to have a cortical as well? But right. I don't I was just about to mention that. that. Ages. Yeah. So you, that, that sort of doing a CT and doing a cortical isn't something that you'd necessarily worry about Ooh, so much yeah, now. It I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't okay. seem to be. Um, I think there's very good evidence that doing a cortical mastoidectomy adds absolutely nothing to the chances of su successful outcomes. So I would definitely not do a yeah, cortical. Do, yeah. Anybody else, Keith or, or, or Will, do either of you consider a cortical or is that old hat now? Not routinely. No, I, I would consider an adenoid. Sorry to butt in, Will, you carry on. No, I, I was saying, no, I wouldn't do one routinely. I mean, if you look at this picture, um, the middle ear is actually quite quiescent yeah um, and actually th th this is again a more meringitic so i wouldn't operate on an infected perforation if there was mucopus around i wouldn't if there was a moist ear and so the there was inflammation i would and so so i, I would draw that difference if you've got uh, well, mucopus I, in the ear. Mike, Mike wanted us to be provocative so uh, <laughs> yeah I'm just going to try and <laughs> stir it up a bit so you, you, your kid arrives on when whatever day your operating list is you have a look in the ear and it's pussy you're going to cancel them and bring them back on another day so what i, I do on. So, so 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 with perforations i see them between one and two weeks beforehand because i don't want to cancel them on the day mm -hmm. so i'll see them if they've got a, a pussy ear i will treat them with drops and when they come back usually they don't have a pussy ear but they might have a moist ear and so i don't like mucopus but I'm very happy with slightly stained mucus. Okay. Um, if they arrive, if I haven't seen them and they arrive on the day and they've got an active pussy ear, I'll send them home. Okay. Good. So uh, let's talk about another one, Adrian. Adrian, one sorry. Word, sorry. I just wanted to throw in the word adenoidectomy because I think, you know, if we're talking about young yeah. children mm -hmm. uh, and in discharging ears, it's important to consider that that may be um, contributing to the problem. Absolutely. Okay. Um, if, if, if they're enlarged or just regardless of whether they're enlarged or not um well i yeah i don't know uh, okay yeah, really, but, uh, yeah okay let's let's move on here's another perforation that um eight-year-old uh the hearing in the other is okay they've got a very marginal conductive loss in this side once again they're getting infected and you've decided to bite the bullet and operate um well i would have done let's say but of course i could be proved wrong um, Susan, what surgical approach for that one? So, so to be fair, it's, again, it's, it's a small, perf well, relatively small perforation. So mm -hmm. you've got a few options. You could do it, and so you could certainly do it endoscopically yeah. with, uh, permeatally and use, um, tragal perichondrium or, um, cartilage to help to reinforce that 
uh, you could make a small end oral incision or a small post oral and repair it. So mm. I don't tend to use a cartilage button. I tend to use grafts and I tend to use cartilage as well. Um, but I think this would be a fair one to do endoscopically. It's small if, enough. If you were doing that one, let's say you were doing it end orally or post orally, would you use cartilage routinely to, to reinforce the repair? So, so I, um, I tend to use cartilage. I just I make it quite thin, but I tend to use cartilage. Yeah. In my hands, it gives better results than just using pressure. Okay. Um, I, I know which way you'd repair this, Adrian. I suspect you'd use the endoscope. Keith, what would you do? Yeah, I like Adrian's way of doing it. I'd probably still use the microscope at the moment. It'd be tempting to try a, to freshen and a push through uh, underlay fascia graft, but because uh, it always seems like such a lot of work to lift the posterior flap, uh -huh. flip the eardrum over, and then uh -huh. and pack under that. But um, so a, a push through is where you get a bit of tragal perichondrium or temporalis. You put gel foam into the middle ear and then you just squeeze you the graft through the hole and arrange it neatly. You can stack it on gel foam. Sometimes you can hold it with surface tension and a little ebby yeah. disc laterally. And but, that works uh, okay for you? Well, no, you have some failures with them. Um, so, really? um, yeah, it's a hard, it, it, it certainly is a tempting, t tempting one to try, but uh, there's always a risk it'll fall away with all that space down towards the eustachian tube there yeah but i suppose a bit like the um you know the the, the butterfly graft you're not you're not doing much to the middle ear space are you you're not lifting it's, it. te it's tempting but all of the maneuvering of the malleus there is in yeah. it sits against the graft so i find it not so helpful to try okay. and snap the the graft in okay will what would you do with this so this is a 30 degree endoscopic view and you're looking around the corner and so if you look straight down the canal they'll have an anterior bulge which will actually obscure probably most of your drums you look down it's, it's a big perforation once you've taken the edges off if you're going to take a decent edge off you, you've got about a 40 percent perforation and if you look it's quite near the anterior annulus mm. and so you're going to be taking a lot of you're going to be getting very close to the anterior annulus and so therefore for any push through you're not going to have the support so i would do this for me would be a post auricular i'd open it up I'd elevate the annulus probably almost 360 degrees. So I'd go around over the top of the um, attic. I'd elevate the anterior annulus from at least down to about four or five o'clock. And then I'd do a temp underlay temporalis fascia onto the bony annulus going under that way. And so you get good support. The anterior ones, the ones that fail. You want to do them well. You want to do that. You want to give them good support. Um, I don't tend to use that much cartilage. I think cartilage is bulky. I think cartilage also doesn't give you the, the flexibility because this is going right up to the malleus. Mm -hmm. And so therefore with cartilage, you get this angulation under the malleus because you could have abut the malleus. And, and actually with, with, with temporalis fascia, you don't. You could also, you could also actually take the, on, on these ones where they're really right up close to the malleus, you can actually take the, the tympanic membrane off the malleus handle down to the umbo, leave it on the umbo, and then you can actually go between the TM and the, um, uh, the malleus to give you support that way. That's the other way of doing it. So, so I would, post auricular, this one's difficult. It's anterior, it's, it's, there's some tympanic sclerosis in the drum. The drum's gonna be a little bit more um, stiff. Um, you're going to have to, if you don't do it carefully and properly with good support, you're going to get a high failure rate in this kind of uh, tympanic okay. membrane. So, there's quite a range of, uh, of, of opinions on that one. That's good. Um, here's Can a, I ask Will a question? Because I didn't quite, I agree with uh, um, everything you, you said, Will, actually, um, except that I would do this endoscopically without any doubt. But I didn't quite catch, you said you'd raise the flap to about four or five o'clock where you elevate the annulus. Do you mean you, you'd start... Um, at the top in the pars faster and, and, and peel the annulus downwards, so, down towards so, the coordinators? So, so, so what I do, what I do with these kind of things is, is I'll do a, a classic uh, um, six to 12 um, incision um, posterior. On the posterior wall, yeah, uh, yeah. On the posterior wall. And then I'll actually come up over the annulus um, underneath the uh, the metal skin. So I, I, I can't show you with my hand, but I'd like to, you go up and over and you go round. And so what you do is leaving the anterior tympanic, um, the, the skin intact, you actually elevate the, the, the annular ligament out. And so you then put the graft under and you tuck it 
between the, the skin, the, the epithelium, and the bony annulus, and so you've got support. So, so fundamentally, yeah. the graph will be on bone 360 degrees. Um, okay, yeah, so that's exactly the same. I mean, you, you said, I didn't quite catch because you said you'd elevate the flap to four or five o'clock, but I guess that's the posterior meatal skin. You, you correct, correct, exactly. Skin. Right, okay, but the annulus, yeah, okay. So I would do exactly the same thing endoscopically, in fact, and then the graph goes underneath the malleus handle. Correct. And, yeah, and, yeah. and so you've actually got graft onto bony annulus 360 degrees. So, yeah. so you, you, are, you, you get no fallback and you've got definite support. Yeah, no, that's exactly the same uh, as I would do. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm going to probably just put one more or so up. Um, let's have a look. Um, yes, I, I quite like someone to talk about this stuff. This is what, what I've always been told is snail tracking. Um, and actually this child's got a, a nice neat hole on one side uh, and they've got that on the other side. And the, the conductive loss is the one on which the snail tracking is. Can you see that everybody? Will, yep. can you see that? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so starting with Keith, uh, that's the one ear, that's the other ear, and that's the audiogram. Do you do you worry about the snail tracking stuff? Do you think it well, means... it, it tells you there's it's trying to there's a little perforation there trying to heal but uh, unsuccessfully. So you get this migration laterally along the the canal wall. Okay. Um, now it's hard to say if it's just a small perforation. There's a, quite a hearing loss on the left ear. I yeah, think, there is. The it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. It so, looks like it should be the other way around, but I did check it. Yeah, so you're not so sure. There could be that. Could be you need to lift that off. Make sure there's not a little sack underneath. Look at the status of the IS joint. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, let's just talk about one more. So here is um, a he. Well, someone who's had a moringoplasty before, maybe a year or two ago, um, and they come back and they've got intermittent dystrophy. They've got this tiny little hole here. Susan, um, what would you do about that? So it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's tiny, but there's clearly a lot of scarring of the throat. A mild hearing loss. I mean, I think I'd be tempted to wait to see if it will settle uh -huh. on its own because it's so small. I mean, if, you, if you're going to treat, then one option is you freshen the edges and put in a bit of gel foam to see if, it will, if that will encourage it to heal. Mm -hmm. um, is anyone still doing fat plugs for things like this, or is that very old-fashioned? I don't. I don't tend to use fat plugs. No. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if the other guys do. Um, Adrian, I don't. But there's a guy in Montreal, Sam Saliba, who's published very good results in the ringoscope from using a fat plug with a puppy disc over the top. Um, but I don't know. Does this you need fixing at all if it's asymptomatic? I don't think well, it's no, going to change getting... the hearing if you if you if you close that little hole. Uh, well, of course. Um, if if for example this was a kid with a cleft palate and a retraction on the other side, I'd be delighted to get this result because that little hole will equalise middle ear pressure probably in a fairly asymptomatic way. So mm. um, it does depend on the kid's situation really whether you'd want to do anything about it or not. Yeah. Just say let's say it's getting a bit infected. Um, would you, you know, every every two months they're getting discharged from that ear? Would you... Yeah, it's difficult because obviously all my perforations close after. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's an academic question for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no it's difficult. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'd do. I, maybe I would, um, goodness knows, uh, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, as Will said, once you have to make your decision about what you're going to do after you freshen the edge. Because you yeah. might find that when you kind of cut this up a bit, all the scar tissue comes away and you've got a much bigger hole than you thought. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I, I might do a cartilage butterfly graft for a little hole like that if it, yeah. if it looked like it would pop in well. But uh, I mean, there, yeah. there isn't a right answer for this. It's not like I did okay. something clever and I'm going to present you with a beautiful eardrum because that's not the case. I think I sat on this for a bit and just took, took the one photo. Um, well, do you, what would you say about this? So my, I, the question I would ask is, um, did, it work, did this work and then has it re-perforated because sometimes you okay. see sometimes you see these ears which fundamentally the perforation is part of a sort of a long-term process and is almost nature's grommet and you close it and then it goes pop and you get a little perforation back so so it could be 
if one's generous, that you've re-perforated. The, the other aspect is it could be an aspect, it hasn't healed. So mm -hmm. I would want to know, did it heal then re-perforate or has it just not healed? Mm -hmm. If it's just not healed, if it's, if it's re-perforated, then the trouble is if you try and do something, you're going to get a problem in another place. It mm -hmm. might be one of these patients who do get recurrent acutitis media. Um, if it's not healed, I would, if it's causing problems, I would probably um, endoscopically or microscopically try and freshen the edges and I would either use cartilage or fat. I always think of what's going on there as chronic otitis media, um, where your ears have been inflamed from some form of infective insult and it's trying to heal and it's a battle between the two. Um, and so a perforation is not just a defect, it's, it's a sign that battle occurred. Next one. I'll give me a second. There you go. Right. I'll stay on. So, so, so I, I think we, we used to talk about tubular tympanic, CSOM, selfie and unsafe. And I think we ought to change to COM with cholesterol and without. And without, we often call it mucosal. Next one. And it can be active. It's got discharge. Inactive. You've still got the pathology. It's dry. It's healed. And the next picture shows you, and this is a classic, healed COM. So you can see the tympanosclerosis, the thin drum. This is the end product. Next one. So tympanic membrane retractions. Next one. So what's going on? So due to the inflammation, you've lost the middle fibrous layer. So therefore you have a thin eardrum. And with children, if you've got ET dysfunction and negative middle ear pressure, you then get this thin segment starts to retract. And it can be anywhere, but classically posterior and superior. It can stick to the ossicles, and then if it sticks, it can start to erode or collect debris to form cholesteatoma. Next. And so this is simple atrophy. So on the left, you can see a drum which looks normal, but when the child valsalvas, it bulges out. So they've got over their eustachian tube dysfunction, and therefore it doesn't retract, but it's still there. Next one. So prevalence varies in certain populations. Navajo is quite small, uh, more in the Danish. But interestingly enough, if you've got glue ear, um, quite a lot of that retractions over time and some can be advanced. Next. So the big question is, if you've got a retract in a child, which ones are going to progress? And how do we answer that question? And, and it is very, it's quite hard, I think. Carry on. So for the, the registrars, you need to know the two classifications, TOS and SADE of attic and past tensor. You probably know them already just to run through them for the registrars. Carry on. So TOS describes attic retractions. There's a mild where it's just beginning to pull back in. If it touches the malleus neck, it's stage two. If it's causing some erosion of the bone at the top of the ear, it's three. If you can see malleus and incus head, then it's four. Carry on. So this is, you look at this and you can see there's an attic retraction. You can probably see the head of the malleus, possibly something more. Yeah. That's probably stage four, but in a, a crying, wriggling child, it's quite difficult. Carry on. So attic retractions, etiol, uh, sort of prevalence in children between five and 10, most are, are small, but you do get one or 2% which are quite deep. Carry on. So Sade, now, Sade classification of the of the PARS tensor, um, there are some issues with it because um, he talks about grade one being mild retraction, grade two touching the incus of stabes, grade three onto the promontory, but it comes off if you if you suck it or with a valsalva, grade four is adherent. Um, but the trouble is a lot of retractions go to multiple areas. So what I will do clinically is I will write what Sade group grade it is, but also I will draw it and document that. Next. So in terms of Sade, grade one doesn't tend to progress. Grade two can come and go, but about 16% may worsen. Grade four, often they worsen, but still 16% and 10% may go towards cholesteatoma. So next one. So what we're looking at is, if you look at the, the more significant retractions, roughly about 10 to 15% will progress to cholesteatoma. However, by the corollary, 
85 to 90 percent will either stabilize or improve in children and and we see these in terms of adults you, you see adults and you look at their ears and they've got a stable pocket that's been for years so the question is which do need surgery which of those small groups need surgery how do we choose carry on so what options we've we got we can either manage it conservatively now i've always liked the term miclo masterly inactivity with cat-like observation and also do their hearing um or we can operate either on the drum or as Adrian suggested on the adenoids if you have a child who's got eustachian tube dysfunction. Carry on. So what surgery are you going to do? If it's in the attic, you could try and ventilate it, but that doesn't often work too well. If you're going to do something, you're probably going to actually have to expose the pocket and reconstruct it in one of the surgical ways. Next one. In the, in the past tensor, these often will actually respond to ventilation. So you can either ventilate, you can, if the pocket's mobile, excise it and ventilate. You can excise it and reinforce it or do something bigger. Next one. Which pockets need surgery? Well, I think about my clinical practice and what do I decide on? Is it attic or is it past tensor? What stage? What's the age of the child? If they're young, it might improve with the eustachian tube functioning improving. If they're older, this might be more permanent. What does the contralateral ear look like? What's their hearing like? Does it discharge and does it progress? Really, we're all trying to weigh up what to do. And we want to know what's the potential for progression, which ones we should operate on, but also the risks of surgery. Although I'm sure in your hands, um, Adrian or Mike, you never have problems. <laughs> However, occasionally you do, and occasionally it doesn't work quite as well as you hope. Mm -hmm. And and if 85% are going to be fine, well, you've got to weigh that up. So it's hard and fast rules are difficult. Carry on. So what grade? <laughs> Retracting back looks to me like a grade one. Next one. So now it's touching the incus, but also you've got glue. So is that two or does glue put into a different grade so probably grade two so next one what i would do generally for these is grade one or two good hearing no no activity normal ear probably watch um, if it stays stable continue watching if they've got glue ear consider a grommet next one so here timulus grossus we're just touching the incus maybe a bit of incus erosion next slide Here, you can just see it touching possibly the promontory, but anteriorly you've got a bit of a retraction as well. Is that a bit of keratin building up? Mm -hmm. Next slide. So grade two or three, if they've got good hearing, if they're not active, again, I'd watch, but if it's progressing or not improving, think about excising and ventilating. Next one. Now here, we've got a grade three, it's touching the promontory, but more importantly, you can just see it starting to erode the long process of the incus. So maybe the hearing's going off. Next slide. So hearing's going off, grade three, I would certainly do something about it. I'd elevate it, I'd possibly reinforce it, or ventilate it. Next one. Well, just a query about that. Yeah. Uh, Mike, could you just go back one, please, to the to the photograph? So, so if you excise that area that's retracted, particularly where it might be adherent to the cicular chain, yep. are you concerned about having bits of drum left behind? Absolutely. And so, I would want to see if it comes off nicely. I'm happy. If it sticks, I'll use the laser and I'll fry um, to make sure there's nothing left in there. If I'm not certain, I will reconstruct and second look. Okay, w w would you do a DWI MRI? I don't think they work well enough because I'm not expecting to, to, to leave a huge amount. Um, and I'd much rather go back in. Also, when you take this off, it is possible their hearing will get worse because they've got a fibrous connection. And so what I'd want to do is if their hearing was poor, if they've got about, it might be they're dropping off to 30, 40 decibels, I'd elevate, and then if they've got some LPI left, I'd 
probably bond on some serrano cement if it had gone entirely so so i would i would reconstruct at the time if i was very happy i got it clear or i'd reconstruct and i'd come back if the hearing wasn't good okay and do you wait about a year for that yeah okay okay um, I know you seem to be quite uh, keen on the KTP laser well, is that, would that be fair to say? Um, I think it's great for otological use. Yeah, okay, Works yeah, well. that's what I meant. <laughs> Where are we? Here we are. So, 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 so that's the kind of result you want. So nicely reconstructed, if they've got good hearing and I'm happy it's out, watch it. If actually I've worried I've left something or the hearing's poor, I'll go back in at a year. Okay. Next one, Mike? Yep. Uh, so, great for touching the promontory, um, looks adherent, but also you can see it beginning to go around the ossicles as well. And so, the, the, great for doesn't describe it so well. You need to actually write down what you see. Next one. So, it all depends, for me, it all depends on the hearing at this point and whether it's inactive or active, because you see adult ears like this, it just remain stable and they've got good hearing. So, so I'd probably still watch if it's stable, I might continue to watch. If it's progressing or not improving, then I might well do something. Okay. Next one. And then you get progression. On the left side, you can see that snail trail of keratin just beginning to not come out of the, the hypotympanum. And on the right side, you've got, you've got activity. Next one. And so with this one, you'd, I think you want to do something. You want to get in there. It's progressing. And what you don't want, next slide, is you've waited too long and there you can see the cholesterol building up and you've eroded LPI. So it's, it's very difficult because ideally you see these regularly, you photograph them and you look for progression. But we work in a system in the NHS where you ask them to come back at two or three months and, they, and you see them a year later. And so I, I haven't got an answer for that. And so, so Mike, next I've got a few ones that get to go. What, what do you think of this? What do you think is going on? And can you give it a grade? And what would you do? Who's going to start? Should we go in order? Susan? So, so in terms of a grade, part of it's on the promontory. It looks adherent, so potentially a four, I think you'd, I'd be concerned about. You've got this bit of wax over the uh, long process of incus and stapy. So really, you need to take that out to see what's going on. Um, so Mike, go on to the next slide. So, so I don't think it's wax, I think it's keratin. It, it's keratin, it's almost like a keratinous horn building up over, over what is likely to be the area we see now. So, so, so I've now removed that under the microscope. Right, okay. So so I would be thinking that that's unlikely because it because it looks like keratin. It looks like it's adherent. You know, I'd be having that discussion with the family depending on the age of the child. Uh, if you really wanted to try conservative, then you could examine under the microscope, put in a grommet, and see if it elevates. But I think it's unlikely to do that because of the extent of the retraction. In which case, I need to excise it and reinforce it with cartilage. Is what I'm thinking. Okay, Keith. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it looks surgical right from the start. It looks like a tympanoplasty here. Um, uh, hearing test or um, CT, maybe a CT scan. Um, depends if they've had a lot of pain. How long this has gone on for? Check and see how deep that attic retraction is superiorly. Um, but yeah, discussion with the family about uh, actively intervening rather than continuing to watch for a long period of time and uh, attempt an aplasty procedure. Okay, Adrian, um, open or yeah. endoscopic? Oh, I would do it. If I was going to do anything surgically, I would do it endoscopically without any doubt. Um, the question really is whether I would do anything surgical at all. The problem with all these retraction cases, if you put in a grommet, um, the grommet's going to fall out and then um, either the physiology will have improved and the kid will be okay, which would have happened whether you put the grommet in or not, or the physiology hasn't improved and you're back where you started. Uh, and often when these ears have had several sets of, of grommets, they don't last very long. So you might be um, putting a grommet in uh, 
you know, once or twice a year for years uh, and uh, never really change the, uh, the outcome. So I wouldn't put a, a grommet in. The problem, as, as people have alluded to, the problem with doing a cartilage tympanoplasty here is you might make the hearing worse. Uh, that happens. I looked at my data and it was about, I can't really remember, about one in 20 or 30, the hearing got, uh, got worse. Uh, mm. and, and occasionally, as, as people have alluded to, you know, there will be the risk of, of skin getting trapped. And so you then get, uh, you've caused a cholesterol when they didn't have one in the first place. Um, I, I would have cleaned, most kids would have, I think it's fair to say, would allow you to clean off that keratin in the clinic. Uh, and uh, if there's maybe no granulate, they would. <laughs> sorry, the, I said maybe well, they would in Toronto. Yeah, it, it about Bristol. To put on the kid, doesn't it? But, <laughs> yeah. um, um, if, if, if they wouldn't, then I would um, get them to put oil drops in to soften it up. And, and sometimes you find when they come back the oil, that the keratin has migrated spontaneously. And I think I, you know what, in, in the old days, I would have done a cartilage tympanoplasty on this ear. Um, but uh, these days, I don't think I would. I would just monitor it. And if keratin be begins to accumulate in the tympanic isthmus, either anteriorly or posteriorly there, uh, that, I, that is not cleanable, uh, then I would operate. I think the aim for me is to save the stapes um, more than saving the incus, really. Right. Okay. That's how I approach the cleft palate population as well. Wait and wait and wait until the keratin is gathering and not, and not clearing. Because if you, if you go in and reinforce, even if you leave a millimeter gap around your cartilage, invariably re-retracts. Um, you know, I think that's it. the problem. I agree, Keith. Yeah, yeah. You, you do get some great results from a cartilage tympanoplasty in this kind of ear. But I just have a feeling those are the ones that would have been okay if you'd done nothing. Mm -hmm. So it would have been stable. I don't know. I don't know the answer, and I think you you said this well that you know it's it's difficult. Uh, you also another thing that's um, important actually that we haven't really emphasized is the preference of the parent. You know, you're going to get informed consent. Uh, are they the kind of parents that want to do anything to try and preserve the hearing and really want surgery, or are they the kind of parent that's terrified of having surgery and really wants to try and you know hope that it will get better without doing anything? Uh, yeah. That for me ends up really being the deciding factor. Is parental preference okay okay um well should we do another one so there's, there's, there's a question on the chat mike yeah i would oh there was a question on the chat yes is there a place for otovent in the management of retractions well um i'm unsure whether otovent truly works however it's a way of keeping the parent and child occupied while you're waiting mm -hmm. And so, so, so by all means, I would, I would normally say, fine, we're going to wait. Why don't you try this Otovent device? Whether it truly works, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Susan, do you use it? I, I don't tend to. No, I tend not. Um, what about uh, you station tube dilation, Adrian, with your <laughs> North American colleagues? <laughs> uh, I am not uh, an enthusiast. Uh, and uh, I'm quite skeptical about the um, uh, potential for improvement in this kind of scenario. And I have spoken to a lot of people every time I get the opportunity, really, and I don't get the feeling that it has been beneficial in ears with tympanic membrane retraction. Obviously, Dennis Poe's study shows that it makes middle ear pressure a bit better for a while afterwards in adults, uh, but um, I don't have any enthusiasm for doing this in children that might um, grow out of their uh, disease. And you can, you, know, you can calculate a number needed to treat if it was sort of 50% uh, effective uh, and 10% um, uh, you know, of these cases are gonna turn into cholesteatoma, uh, then you're gonna have to do, um, I can't do maths and talk at the same time, <laughs> but you're gonna have to do a lot of cases before uh, you um, uh, get one, um, one, one you know, successful, uh, benefits so uh, it's pushed very hard perhaps for um, perhaps there's too much economic pressure in the uh, in the equation to uh, really figure out the place of it surely not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah but it would be great if it does work so we have to you know remain a little bit open-minded about yeah. it I think it should be done I think you know it should really only be done in properly controlled trials but mm. you probably need five year follow-up on every patient to really figure out whether it did anything or not yeah Okay. Can I okay. just ask, Adrian, you said that you, you'd observe it, but if you're going to operate, you'd do it endoscopically. 
would yes. you still do, I'm presuming you'd still do a cartilage tympanoplasty. I would definitely, yes, yeah, with the tragus, yeah. Okay. All right, Adrian, you start this time. Oh dear, okay, well, that's a pity because I was going to wait and see what everybody else said. I'm wondering <laughs> why you're showing this picture. Um, and I'm sometimes when you look at these things more carefully, you can kind of see through the drum and see the edge of the foot. The problem that we have here is that you can't see the limits of the retraction pocket. It looks like the, I mean, I don't know if that's the tip of the incus or the capitulum of the stapes that we can see through the, uh, through the defect. Uh, but apart from, you can't see the sidewall of the pocket anywhere. Sometimes when you look a bit harder, you can actually see the limits of the, of the pocket underneath the eardrum. Um, but I can't really see that. So that makes me guess that maybe it doesn't go too far anteriorly. Um, there's no keratin buildup, the snail track thing around the edge of the um, pocket, which makes me think that it's probably self-cleaning. Um, I mean, of course, what we would do is we'd take history and we'd examine the other ear as well and we'd get an audiogram and all that kind of thing. But um, I don't know, in, question, in terms of what I would just do for that one on its own, uh, I rarely actually, as a, as a rule of thumb, I rarely um, book surgery the first time I see a retraction pocket unless it's actually a cholestatoma. Normally I would, you know, clean them up, talk about stuff and then see them again a few months later just to see if it got worse or better. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm interested to hear what um, other people say and, and, and see what, um, what happened to this kid. It's a bit, it's an unusual appearance, really. Okay, Keith, what would you do here? Uh, yeah, it's an unusual appearance, but it might be stable. It might stay like that for decades. So it depends on the age of the child, as Adrian says, all the other factors. So I would be watching that for the first few visits, doc photo documentation, okay. showing it to the family. And... Uh, if there's any sign of skin gathering or, um, you know, you have to do something about it. Susan? I agree. I think I do find the photo documentation in clinic is quite helpful because it, it's a reference point, particularly if, if, as in the NHS, you're not always the person seeing the patient. So it becomes much more obvious if the problem is getting worse. Um, I might have tried to grom it until Adrian said he doesn't think you can work so <laughs> tall. Um, but clearly, um, th that sense of, well, can I improve middle ear ventilation? Um, but I think it just depends if they, you know, if they, if they had any history of a smelly discharge or if the hearing goes down, then I'd be thinking, do I need to investigate further? Do I need to do a scan? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Will, anything else to add to that, Will? Um, so no, I, I'd agree with most of that. I mean, interestingly enough, if you look at it, if you look at the pocket carefully, you can inferiorly, you can see some bubbles of glue. Yeah. And and so so this is a child who's got glue ear, and so I actually put a grommet in this one because I always think if you can see glue, that means they have definitely got something going on in their middle ear space. Um, and this is one of these strange ones, and and this is why I think the Sade classification really has limitations and you really have to describe or photo and so I actually anterior meringotomy lots of fluid and with a sucker I was able to peel and pull this off so it came out like a sock and then I then, then I had that big question do you cut the suck off or do you actually just put the grommet in and hope the the drum will refashion mm. um, and the answer is I can't remember what I did um, <laughs> so, I, because this is some years ago. Uh, but 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 usually with this kind of deep retraction, if it comes out, and sometimes they do. I'm, I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised how sometimes you release the pressure and you actually get the sock coming out. And and I usually cut the sock off because mm. I think that when you've got so much floppy tissue. You actually but, want um, to, I prefer, I prefer well, perforation than the very deep retraction. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Um, I've only done that once and, uh, and then um, shortly after it retracted and became a cholestetoma. And I, I spoke <laughs> to John Hamilton about this because his predecessor, um, Philip Robinson, used to do that procedure of amputating retraction pockets and was quite happy with the results. But John got to see the long-term uh, outcome, which um, was of re-retraction and perhaps not surprisingly because you've got you know you've replaced the if it does heal over it's going to be relatively atrophic layer with no middle fibrous layer so it's not very strong and so it's not really surprised that it would retract again 
Um, so I, but, I but that's have to about that, uh, Will. So, so that, that's why you've got to put the grommet in as well. Yeah, but then what would you do when the grommet comes out? Because that's only a six month uh, so, so, so temporizing. It would, it would all depend upon the age of the child, because if they were mm -hmm. still within the glue ear phase, I would grommet them or T-tube them. I, I don't tend to do that many T-tubes. I'll put in three grommets before a T-tube. Mm -hmm. um, but I would try and see them through their eustachian tube function phase. Yeah, I think, it's, I think that's a fair point. And I think the problem that I have with my practice is that often it's the people who've had lots of sets of grommets that, that are sent to me what to do next. And the reason they're sent to me is because the parents have got disillusioned with the, uh, the management they've had with their other um, a secondary, uh, you know, in, in secondary care. Uh, and uh, so I only see one end of the spectrum, perhaps. And I can imagine that there probably aren't, like you say, a lot of uh, younger kids that would benefit from uh, a tube as a temporizing measure, stop things getting worse while we wait for them to grow out of their problems. So I, I probably don't see that um, the benefits the way that you do, I guess. I, I suppose, I suppose my view has always been I'd much rather repair a perforation than actually a deep yeah. adhering oh, really retraction yeah. going to cholesterol yeah. So, 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 for, for me, I will have a conversation with the parents about perforation good, retraction bad. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yes. Okay. So, 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 what do people think of this one? Um, Susan. Very unhappy ear. Um, yeah, so it looks like there's glue, uh, which you can see sort of posturing fairly, but there's a fair degree of attic retraction as well. So I'd be thinking, is there cholesteatoma in this? Is there some cholesteatoma that you're not seeing? And just that anterior portion almost looks as if there's some white substance behind the drum as well. Um, but that might just be the reflection. So I think it, it depends on the symptoms. If it's, you know, if it, if it looks like it's just hearing loss and there's glue, then we might try a grommet. But I think if they're having a smelling discharge as well, I'd want to CT them, see what their hearing's like, see if there's anything more that I'm not seeing just by looking at the drum. Okay. Um, Keith? Yeah, history, audiogram, and CT scan based on that irregular whitish mass and an anterior inferior segment. Yeah. Because, okay. of course, just the, the tiny little mouth in the attic doesn't tell you anything about the extent of the sac, of course. Mm -hmm. so it can be quite extensive. Adrian? Yeah, so when I look at this, I'm not worried about mm -hmm. the mesotympanum. I think the bulge, you can see the bulge from the tensor tympani muscle canal, I think, uh, just above the eustachian tube orifice. And I think that the other white stuff uh, in the anterior inferior quadrant is probably just the promontory would be my interpretation of, of, of how I see this picture and with a bit of moringa sclerosis posteriorly. So I think in the middle ear, there's just um, an effusion and that might benefit from, from having a tube put in. Uh, but what worries me is the pars flaccida retraction because there is that little bit of keratin building up around the edge of it. And I think this is a really difficult question is how do you know when cholesteatoma has developed in the depths of a deep pars flaccida retraction? And the problem is if you do a CT scan on this kid, um, well, I know that you're gonna see um, opacity in the mastoid because there's opacity in the middle ear. And so the scan won't help, unless there's a massive amount of bone erosion, which hmm. if we've been following this kid, you know, maybe there won't be, the CT scan isn't really gonna help you. Uh, you could put a tube in first so that the middle ear is ventilated and then do the scan, but even so, if the um, if that's a big attic pocket, then um, you know you might not get ventilation in the antrum. So you don't really know if this is a, a cholesteatoma or not. Um, and we we talked about MRI earlier, and the problem with MRI is that uh, really you need a a, a a cholesteatoma more than three millimeters in diameter to have a sort of 90 95 percent chance of picking it up. So MRI won't help you here either if it's a small cholesteatoma. So I think this is a, a difficult problem. And actually, the, the case that I'd offered um, to discuss, which I think we don't need to go get to now, um, was exactly this dilemma of when do you decide to operate on an attic retraction pocket? And um, I am concerned about this one. So I probably, I guess what I would do is um, have a careful look at that endoscopic, that pocket endoscopically 
uh, at the time of putting a uh, at the time of putting a grommet in. And the grommet's going to have to go in that posterior inferior quadrant, I think, because there isn't anywhere else really to put it. Okay. Uh, Will, is there a right answer to this? <laughs> well, the, 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 well, what I did was so I had exactly the same view. Um, th this is an, an unhappy drum. I like that. I always like that phrase, an unhappy drum. And you've got some widespread atelectasis. You've got anterior um, retraction, and that I don't like anterior retraction because it, that's always that's always a bad sign. Um, and you've got this attic where. Uh, certainly there's nothing going on in it, but it's got a, got, a, got a deep pocket and you can see the invagination. So uh, the hearing was 30, about 30, so would go with glue ear. Um, so, so I took it to theatre, I put a grommet in, I had a look with an, an endoscope and the, the, retract, the, the, the attic retraction looked like it did. There was no hugely deep uh, fingers going in, but you've still got a degree of quite deep retraction. Um, the grommet actually brought the hearing up to about 20, 25, so not, not normal, but okay. Um, and currently, and, and then I had a conversation with the parents, which is, we've got an attic retraction, it's difficult to know, we may come to surgery at some point. And so we decided together that we would watch this attic, even though it was grade four, it may not come to anything, or it may, and so I say to the patient, I say to the patient and the parents, look, uh, we can watch and it may be we come to surgery at some point, but I can't tell you. So at the moment we're watching this with a grommet. Okay, excellent. So the, so I'm sorry, I, could, I didn't have an endoscopic photo for this. Uh, it's the right tympanic membrane. And it, so I should probably just start with what do people think about this drum, provided you can see enough of it. Otherwise I'll have to tell you about it. Okay, uh, I'll start with Keith. What do you think, Keith? Uh, it's a limited view. I think it's a right ear, and I think the anterior TM looks normal, and the posterior TM looks different. Could, <laughs> could be something <laughs> white I behind it. That. <laughs> <laughs> Can't see the attic clearly. Okay, there is something white behind it. So, in history is he's five years old, um, presents with something white behind his right ear, but having some uh, recurrent ear discharge. Um, what would your go-to investigations be? Is this an, this an intact eardrum? We're, not, uh, we're thinking congenital classitoma or it's been running, did you tell me there? It's been running. It's, it's been, been running. running. Yeah. Okay. So it looks more than simple AOM with discharge if there's a white mass there behind, behind the posterior tympanic membrane. So what's my... So depending on the age, CT is quick, readily available, multi-slice scanner, they whiz through in a minute. Um, so that's probably my go-to if this is urgent. Um, MRI, better soft tissue resolution, but in a, in a three-year-old, it might take a sedation or a, or a GA. So I'd, have, I'd be wary of, uh, of that. But okay. uh, cross-sectional imaging, probably CT. CT, okay. And... Okay, so potentially if we go to the next, yeah, I think we'll just have to go to the next slide because I haven't got yeah. a picture of his other ear. So, so when he, so the original picture, when he was five, he presented with the mask behind the drum. Um, and this is two years later. So <laughs> I haven't given you a lot of information in between. Yeah. Um, but all the scans are his scans. So, so if you tell me what you think about his scans. Okay, um, Adrian. So should, we, should we stay with Keith? Yeah, go on, Keith. Yeah, so, right, yeah, so the right, there's soft tissue filling the right external auditory canal, and you can see it abutting onto the shape of the tympanic membrane. Uh, and unusually, the, meso, the, the air containing middle ear space looks relatively preserved there. So that's a little unusual. I'd want to see the slices above and below. Yeah, so, so do you want to go through the other... Um, Radiology. Yep, definitely. Uh, so if you just skip forwards to the ones yeah. that have, yeah. These ones here, yeah? Yeah. Great. So you've got that one, and that one, and that one. Right. Goodness. So this is a very unusual temporal bone. There's funny ground glass appearance here on the, on the right side on the coronal images. So uh, very unusual. Tell, yeah, so, so the original picture, 
he did have right. cholesteatoma on his right side. Right. And he had a combined approach on that side. Sorry, go back. Yeah. This is, this is post-surgical, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, it's po so on the right oh, side, it's post-surgical. There's a cortical okay. mastoid, yes. Okay. Yeah. But the left side is not. And then the left side isn't. So he's presented now with, with a similar, with in fact, the identical appearance of what was on his right ear, age seven, he's now got the identical appearance on his left side. Wow. So okay. he's already had combined approach. And in fact, we were investigating, sorry, that's another child. We were investigating him for a possible recurrent disease. Initially, he had a DWI MRI. So the question is, is sort of what do you think about his ear? What would you... What would your advice to his parents be? How would you manage it? <laughs> so he, it sounds like he's the one in 10 with bilateral disease. Um, so he said surgery on the right side. Often when they present this young, um, uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be more aggressive too. So we assume he's got bilateral disease and we have to address the, the other ear. We have to look at the hearing very carefully. It looks like there's a disease in the, in the initially operated ear uh, as well. It's a wee bit hard to see on those coronal scans but I'd want to go through them very carefully and maybe examine that ear under anesthetic. And the left ear is full of soft tissue there in the in prusik space and right up to Tegman. Yeah. So we'll have to address the other ear now. So okay. Susan, what happens next? We... What happens next with this? Well, I suppose really it's, um, so, what we did for him was have a long discussion with his family because at that stage he was seven. He'd already had mastoid surgery on his right. And I was telling that he needed to have that on his left. Yeah. Um, so it's really from the panel, what would your preference be for a child with, so he's not, well, he had a canal wall up on one side. What would you be thinking to do for it? So he, he's got cholesterol, it's shown on the DWI scan. He's got normal hearing on the left side. He did have a significant loss on the other side. And I think both his Inca sand stapes were destroyed. Nice. He's got normal hearing on the left side. So, yeah. so it's sort of what would your preferred surgical approach be? And what advice, the, his parents are concerned about his ear discharge, but also about his hearing. So what would you be thinking about what would you be telling them about that? How would you manage that? Right. I'll do a quick, I'll do a quick do answer. On, uh, yeah, so quickly, I had, I had one like this recently. I suppose one of the concerns would be the better hearing ear. If you've got a low mill stage on that side, go in there quickly, preserve the chain if at all possible, and try and keep that as the better hearing ear. Um, another argument would be go for the, the recurrent disease size, but but... But more recently, I chose to try and save the better hearing ear and keep the chain intact. Mm -hmm. And then six weeks later, go back and tackle the recurrent disease there. But yeah, these are unfortunate because you're talking about two surgeries maybe in each year. You have to bring these families with you and counsel mm -hmm. them carefully. Okay. Adrian. Yeah, that would be my um, strategy as well, Keith. And I think from the, for, you know, from the trainee's point of view, those that are, are listening, um, we're taught, oh, you never operate on a better hearing ear. Uh, but I think maybe that um, rule, if you like, comes from perhaps from otosclerosis surgery from the days when uh, there was no comeback. If you caused a dead ear, you didn't want to operate on the, uh, on the good ear. Uh, but um, here, if we don't operate on the left ear, this child will end up with hearing loss. If we do operate on the left ear, they might end up with good hearing afterwards. So you need to do the surgery to prevent hearing loss developing. And you can see on the scan that there's no disease in the oval window, which is so that, you know, the stapes is, is clearly um, okay at the moment. But uh, you can also see that the disease doesn't, you know, there's a, there's a bit of an air gap but between the incus and the facial nerve there. So it's quite possible that you'd be able to peel a cholesterol off, leaving the acicular chain intact. Uh, probably you're going to need to do a combined approach um, Tympanomastoidectomy to do so because um, it certainly looks like that's cholesterol in the mastoid, the way it's all scalloped like that. And I think you said, Susan, from the MRI, it lit up as well. So we're yeah. assuming that's cholesterol, yeah. Uh, I would definitely not do so. And then another rule that uh, at least people often come up with here, I don't know about in, in, in the UK now, but uh, was oh, uh, you shouldn't do canal wall up surgery for bilateral disease. 
Well, I, I think that's, again, incorrect. Um, that's a rather paternalistic approach. You need to have an inform, you need to inform the parents, and if they decide that they want multiple surgeries to try and leave the child with a normal ear, then that's um, their choice, if, so long as resource allows. And um, you definitely want to try and avoid um, bilateral mastoid cavities in a seven-year-old. Uh, I've had a couple of patients that I inherited that needed about 10 examinations under anesthesia to clean their cavities because they couldn't tolerate having it done awake. So we definitely want to avoid uh, canal wall down surgery in children. Um, if you were forced into doing canal wall down surgery, leaving a big cavity, because let's say most of the canal was eroded as well, as you do sometimes see that in young children, then uh, performing an obliteration procedure is going to be the appropriate um, option. Um, but the other reason, of course, not to do canal wall down if you could help it here is because you'd have to take out the ossicles, whereas we're hoping that we might be able to preserve them. Okay. Uh, and I agree with you, Keith, that you, know, you do have to take the parents on that journey. They need to be prepared for the fact that multiple surgeries are likely to be necessary. Well, anything to add? No, I, I would agree. I, I would counsel the parents and I'd say, um, we need to get on because we'll be seeing each other a lot over the next 10 years. Let's, uh, let's be friends. I would, I would go immediately for the left ear. I would do canal wall up because mastoid misery is not what you want. And that, and that just ruins the relationship. Um, I totally agree with Adrian. It looked like stapes is viable. So you want to stay the stapes. Even if you, even if you have to take out the other ossicles, mm -hmm. you then got the stapes to use. I would probably counsel and I'd start um, a Baja soft band um, preoperatively because it's likely with a, a canal full of um, packing, um, even if you leave the ossicles in, you're going to have a period where they're going to have a quite a significant bilateral conductive hearing loss. Um, and so I'd go in early for the left, um, try and sort out the disease. I, I'll then go back to the right, uh, I'll do the right, and then I'd leave it nine months and do the left again. Okay. Excellent. You can also consider doing a relatively um, conservative second look. If you, you, you know, with, with the endoscope, I've, I have on a few occasions done the uh, contralateral second look um, with an endoscope um, at the same time as surgery on the other side. So uh, just a small incision behind the ear to look into the mastoid uh, and elevate tympanometal fat. It's very low morbidity, very low risk. And allows you to do get the two operations done under one anaesthetic. So it could be, yeah, depending on how bad the first ear is, um, you may be able to do that. Okay. And this is, this is where the KTP laser is great. Using the KTP laser, if you've got intact ossicles, you want to use the KTP laser. In terms of residual disease, uh, you get a far less um, percentage of residual disease and you can operate on an, an intact acicular chain. So if the chain's intact, that would be the perfect time to laser, 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 take it all off the chain. Um, you've, got, you've got a clear facial nerve and so using the laser is, is not so much of a worry and you want to paint those ossicles and just yeah, really try and be conservative if you can. If you've got to take them out at a later stage, at least you've tried. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right. Yes, yeah, thank you. So, so that is what he had done. I did his left side, reserve, preserved his chain, and then went back and did his right side. Um, and his parents are going on that journey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are going on that journey. So, so the second case, um, so this child also had surgery when he was five. Um, so if you just go ahead, Mike. The, what are we looking at there exactly in that? Picture? Yeah, so what we're looking at is his right tympanic membrane. Okay. And the reason that I presented this one is really that question of uh, what we do about hearing. Um, actually, I, think my, I think the view is not very good. It is the left side. What, what do we do about... Um, hearing in a child who has uh, erosion of the acicular chain. Yeah. So this is a child who presented with a retracted drum, cholesteatoma, had uh, a combined approach. And then after his first procedure, within about six months, because um, I'd done a, put in a, uh, I think it was a torp that I put in, um, a titanium prosthesis, and then that's been eroded with a cholesteatoma on the out. So this is on the outside of his drum. It's just eroded straight through. Uh. So 
I've taken that out. If you just go go to the next slide. That one or the next one? Yeah, yeah, no, this one. So yeah. I so I do the combined approach and I tend to use the endoscope to look around the corner so that I can get a good view. Um, so that's what the other pictures show, but it was really just to discuss with the panel, because I know we're short on time. What's your preference for preserving or restoring hearing when you're going for cholesteatoma surgery? Uh, Will, do you want to start on that one? So my preference is if the chain's intact, I try and leave it intact. Yes. I'll use the KTP. If I have to take, if I have to disrupt the chain, so um, if I have to take the incus out or the malleus out, I'll leave the stapes. I'll always do a cartilage reconstruction. And usually, um, if the stapes is fairly disease-free or unreasonably happy, I'll probably put on a paw at the time of the first look um, in order to support the graft and also to give some hearing. If there's a lot of disease in the sinus tympani, or there's a lot of disease around the stapes at the time of the first look, I might well not put in a port because I don't want to in too many things because I'd much prefer a pearl to take off. Um, if there is loss of stapes, um, I, I will never put in a torp first time around because when you graft with cartilage, you do not know where your cartilage will end up. You don't know if it's going to lateralize or medialize. If you medialize cartilage with a torp behind it, um, Unless you're very careful and you use a Dornhofer foot plate, you can push the, the forces of the middle ear extremely, extremely strong. And you can push a torp through into the vestibule. And um, I know a couple of people have got slides of the torp in the vestibule after the, after the, the first look with a, if you're putting a torp in straight away. So um, no stapes equals um, cartridge reconstruction. I'll often, I, I sometimes put something on the promontory um, to support the graft in the lower aspect. Um, and then when I come back, if there's no stapes, I'll then do a, I know then that the, the cartilage has stabilized, it won't medialize, and it's in its normal place. I'll put a torp in there, but always with a Dornhofer foot plate because I want to actually spread the load um, as opposed to the, the foot, the small foot of a, a torp going right on the foot plate. Um, if I haven't put in a pawp, I'll, I'll, I'll do a pawp at the second at the second look. I, I'm not a great reconstructor on the first. If there's a lot of disease around the stapes, I'm not a great reconstructor on the first on the first look. If the, the stapes is relatively clean, then I certainly will. Um, I'm not expecting that to be the the end um, uh, hearing result because I'm going to go back and if necessary, I'll break that all down and reconstruct it again. Okay, um, Adrian. Uh, yeah, I um, so I'll try and pick up on differences rather than repeating the same stuff. I uh, uh, yeah, try and preserve the ossicles. Uh, always try and preserve the stapes if it's if it's there. I don't use a port actually. Uh, almost I almost never use a port. I just do a cartilage moringa stapediopexy. Uh, if you think about it, when the you know retraction disease that's eroded the um, uh, the incus, the level of the eardrum is at the level of the capitula of the stapes. Uh, the malleus handle is often a bit medialized, and so I can't understand how there's actually space to put a, a port in, uh, especially if you're protecting it with cartilage. So I, I know, it's, you know, I know people do it, but for, but for me, um, I just use uh, cartilage moringa stapediopexy, and about 70 to 80 percent of of kids get hearing within the normal range doing that. Uh, I, like Will, um, don't put a torp in at the first stage uh, for various reasons. One of them is that um, it's quite unstable. If you've got a, a loose piece of cartilage graft that you're putting in and a loose uh, prosthesis, those two things together are too wobbly, and I, I, I just find that an unstable reconstruction. I find it much easier or a more stable situation to do it at the second stage. And Will, I'm delighted to hear you talk about that risk of prosthesis slipping inwards. Um, although it's not something that I've um, seen post-operatively, um, I have heard about it. And I do worry if we put these, you know, titanium pointy things on the stapes foot plate, they're going to be there for 70, 80 years, perhaps, in, in some patients. Uh, how, what percentage of them will erode through the foot plate in that time? We don't know the answer yet because they haven't been around for that long. Uh, and so I, um, I do get consent from parents. When I take consent from parents, I do discuss that. Um, 
unknown, probably small but serious risk. Um, uh, and it's amazing actually how, when we're talk talking about this before their second surgery, a high proportion of um, teenagers and their parents decide they don't want an acicloplasty because they don't really feel they have enough of a problem with their hearing to want to take any kind of risk at all. Um, maybe it's I'm not you know maybe it's the way I explain it, but but it does seem that children do adapt to a moderate conductive hearing loss better than one might imagine. Yeah. Mm. None of them want to wear a hearing aid either. Mm. Yeah, um, maybe they should, but I have difficulty convincing yeah. them. Keith, have you got anything to add? You know, I'm type three. If the stapes is there, that's great. I'm more conservative than the other guys. I'd, I haven't put a torp in in 10 years, so mine get a hearing aid for school use. And uh, yeah, they wear it at school. They don't all wear it at home. But I, only, I take torps out sometimes that other people have put in in the <laughs> middle of recurrent <laughs> cholesteatoma, but I, I don't place them. Do you the results are pretty atrocious with torps, are they not? They're, <laughs> yeah. Is it less than 50-50, isn't it? Yeah. Is it, is it less than 50 but one, one thing that I found really helpful is a Dornhofer shoe. <laughs> And a Dornhofer shoe is 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 a, is a little boat, and it it's almost entirely fits into the into the round window niche, uh, sorry the oval window niche, and sits on the on the the foot plate with a little um, cup to put the end of the torp in, so it also stops the torp moving around because what you don't want is if you don't put something on to hold it, it's like putting a um, a pin on a flat surface, it's gonna, it's gonna wobble around. So the Dornhofer shoe is a really nice thing if you're gonna put a torp in. And also it spreads the load across the foot plate. And so you're not gonna have a sharp pointy thing as Adrian says on the Stabies foot plate, on a bony foot plate. Um, are many of you considering the use of Bajas in these sort of kids? Or is it, is it not normally that big a problem? Anyone? I, Bilat bilateral um, conductive losses, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I think they, like yeah, I mean, it's hard enough trying to persuade them to wear an ordinary hearing aid. Um, yeah. It's a bomb. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, Susan, um, we, what else would you like to say? Anything? No, I mean, I, I'm probably not as conservative with using uh, prosthesis, partly because, you know, my typical patient will say, oh, it's great. Uh, but I treat adults as well as children and they'll say, oh, my ear doesn't discharge, but my hearing's not any better. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it doesn't, you know, part of it is accepting that it doesn't always work. Thankfully, I've not had any that erode through the oval window. So if you just go forwards with that. Um, can I ask you, Susan, do you think your adults complain more about their acquired loss than the teenagers do? I wonder if it's harder for an adult to adjust to it. And one of the reasons that the kids don't complain is because they're more they plastic really and they just get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's true or not? Maybe well as well, you, if you both do adults. I think it's quite possible. Yeah. So, 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 so I think often the adults are used to hearing on that side. And so therefore they notice their loss more. The other aspect of children is I think they do adapt better. But the other issue is, as you mentioned, Adrian, is that you start to talk about a hearing aid and most teenagers blanch and start <laughs> to go a bit wobbly and, and say, no, no, God, no. Now, I would, I would be very interested to know if in 10 years time when they're 25 and they need to actually have a job where they have bi binaural hearing, whether they go, do you know what? I'd quite like a hearing aid. But, and so I think a lot of it is, they hear the options and they hear the word hearing aid and what it'll do in terms of their social group. And they, they get on with it because they don't want to look any different. Yeah, and the problem is when they start trying to wear a hearing aid at 25, they've, all, they've lost their neural plasticity and now the hearing aid's not really gonna work because you know, they've got one dominant ear and one that's useless. So uh, uh, I, it's, it's tough trying to explain all this stuff to them, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I think the transfer of information is really hard because you have a lot of information to give and experience to give Thanks, and, yeah. and you need to bring them up to a very high level in order for them to truly appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Susan, um, do you want to go through the other slides here? Or are you okay? Well, the, the other slides are quite similar. So this is just the endoscopic view of looking at his ear 
and if you go to the the next one this was uh, what are we looking at there exactly uh, as a non-otologist <laughs> so so what i've done is gone to the sort of behind the epitympanum area with the scope because really right. what i'm doing is going around the corner to ensure that there isn't any disease there in all the nooks and crannies and that is where i find the endoscope most useful what's that bulgy thing in the bottom right hand corner mm -hmm. a bit of bone i don't <laughs> <laughs> I've got a name for it. Oh, okay, fine. Sorry. It's from the mastoid end. It's not the. Um... Oh, I see. It's not a thing, right? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, and this is all much the same sort of thing. Yeah. Well, it's just going further around the um, sort of behind the epitympanum. So, in, yeah, in fact, yeah. here you're just over the back end of the facial nerve, aren't you? Uh, okay. Well, I'd... from the mastoid. Your word for it. Yeah. The facial nerve is. I don't know if you can see my browser, but the facial nerve is. Uh, sort of anterior inferiorly, the horizontal portion. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. It I believe like you that I have say. Yeah. Just go to the next slide, Mike. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So this is the this others is know what they're looking at. This yeah. is canal view. Yeah. Um, because he had so much disease, it was just clearing off all of that. So, so, I'm, so on the other view, I've gone behind that, and this is from the canal view. Right. Yeah. So in the so for him because everything had eroded, then what I've done is grafted him and and he's settled. So um, we'll see what happens when we go you know go back in and have a look. Yeah. Yeah. And I say you, you you're quite keen on your cartilage grafts, and I've seen quite a lot of them over the years. And they you know they the ones I've seen of yours are all in the right place. They look lovely mm -hmm. and solid. You know, That's I've good. not seen any that have come out or anything. That's good. No, it's great. <laughs> I've got a few of those. Excellent. No, okay. Um, anything more to to add, Susan, or shall I move no. on to Keith? No, no, I'm, no, move on, please. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. much. Right. So, um, moving. This is a nice segue from the foot plate that Will was talking about. This is another um, Stapy's foot plate case. So, one of the large sections for the trainees in the curriculum in pediatric ENT is congenital deafness and congenital abnormalities over the year. So this case sort of nicely covers uh, both of them. Uh, this is a 12 month old female. I was, or we were asked to have a look at uh, with a second episode of non-meningococcal meningitis. She had her first episode at six months. And the context in the background was the child was being worked up for congenital SN hearing loss after feeling, failing their newborn screen in another hospital. So, uh, in the, the second episode of meningitis was fairly devastating. There was pneumocephalus, widespread changes in the brain. And it was just a shame we hadn't uh, picked this kid up uh, maybe six months earlier. But the imaging was carried out in ICU. You can see an, M, an axial MRI over on the left of your screen there with some high signal intensity filling the middle ear mastoid on the left side. And then there's a, a, a zoned in left temporal bone uh, CT there on the right side of the screen. So something going on with the left ear, ENT trainee called to ICU, um, second episode of meningitis, ENT come and fix this and <laughs> stop this happening again. So w what would the panel um, be thinking about this SN hearing loss, second bout of meningitis? First, one, first episode was H flu, second one was strep pneumo. Okay. Um, child's otherwise well, a mild, a grade one microtia on that left ear externally. So just a slight change on the shape of the pinna. Otherwise twin, born at term. Um, okay, over. Will, do you want to start? So dealing with the CT, first of all, axial section through what looks like a very abnormal cochlea. And so yes. this looks like a really quite a marked dysplasia, almost common cavity. Yeah. Um, it's unusual because you've got a very wide, what looks like, um, over window niche. You can just about see the facial nerve going across the top. We're at the level of the incus and malleus head, so we're quite, quite high there. Um, we've got soft tissue, well, we've got a pacification of the middle ear cleft, um, medial to the ossicles. Um, but we've got some aeration laterally by the looks of it. So the question... I, I suppose, uh, in terms of the middle ear, looking at the middle ear, 
um, Keith, mm. was there fluid behind the middle ear? Yeah, it looked, it, fluid like, it looked ear? like glue, barn door, okay. glue ear so, on the so, top. So, 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 so in that case, what we're looking, what it's looking like is we've got some kind of quite marked co cochlear display, uh, dysplasia. Difficult to see what's going on with the lateral canals. On the MR, on the right-hand side, you can see the lateral canals, the vestibule, the IAC quite nicely. We're just slightly different cut on the left-hand side. Okay. And so we've got a lot of um, uh, signal. And so it's difficult to see how much of that is fluid, how much is not. But uh, difficult to see the, um, the vestibular, but he's, he's got a mark. He's got a mark to what looks like common cavity. Or she, she, yes, is it she? She, she, yes. So, yes. so it'd be more usual to have a common cavity in um, in boys, but uh, yes, you know. I'll show you other cuts. Will make it clear, but you're spot on, uh, spot on there so far. And yes, yeah, so what what on the MR? Well, what do you think of that asymmetry of that very hyper intense fluid oh, filling it, the left side? I'd, I'd want to look like up that. and down. I want to look up and yeah. down because it's 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 definitely abnormal. The que the question is exactly what's going on so it'd be nice to have have a look up and down on those on those cuts if i show you the next slide i'll show you the answer but uh so so, so be it um so w if i go down to the um another axial if you, if you would you like that um shot there but the, the upper one shows you the vestibule nicely well so it's so a big bulky vestibule mm -hmm. that's very abnormal vestibule and also it looks like a widened iac mm -hmm. so again you'd like to look at the cuts up and down um and so you'd be wondering so again you can't see so well the the canals coming off it um and so it could just be there's a a common vestibular cav cavity together with a common um cavity in the um in the uh in the cochlea um yeah yeah, it's not even it's not even forming a basal turn there, as you can see. No medallis. I can't, I can't um, see the bottom bit so well. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. So anyway, so ID uh, ask us to fix this child. I, I, so I think from trainees, you're you're maybe think there's a routine that pediatricians go through, asking about head injury, checking for spinal defects, looking at the organisms to see where this could have come from. But I suppose for me and T, we want to be clued into the the risk of a CSF leak and an ascending meningitis in a kid with a severely dysplastic uh, cochlea. So uh, so we aspirated the fluid um, in ICU. The child was very unwell. Uh, it was watery fluid, positive for beta-2 transferrin. And uh, we have the option in Belfast of phoning a friend, who I think was Blake or Adrian, <laughs> who, who taught me this word last year, cochlea seal. Now, I... I uh, I hadn't heard of this before. Adrian, did you invent this word or had someone else coined it? I think it was one of our radiologists, actually, Manu Schroff. I don't know if you remember him, but he uh, he mentioned it like everybody knew what one was. Uh, right. When we looked it up, we couldn't actually find any reference to it, but that's what it seems to be right. called. So. Fabulous. So I, I learned a lot through, through this case. Anyway, ID are telling me, don't let this happen again. Patch this kid's ear. Uh, so here here's a view from an endoscopic uh, ear procedure with the incus lifted out. So we've child is stabilized. We've gone to theater with a with a tip from Toronto that this is easily fixable. And a little sickle knife has gone. Here's the horizontal facial. The posterior arch of stapes and the tendon was here. The anterior arch was gone. And there was a fairly wide defect of the foot plate with this cystic thing popping out of the foot plate. A wee bit of granulation uh, around the middle ear. Here's manubrium of malleus neck of uh, malleus here. That's the articular surface with the incus, which is now gone. Um, and we've just run a little sickle knife in and the, and the fluid is just seeping out of this space and then packed it with temporalis fascia. Have a little bit of gel foam, I think, sitting here. And then we just slide it in and pack it between the stapes and the fascia. And it's, I think it's about 11 months later. She's had, she's had a bit of glue ear on that side and AOM once or twice, but no further problems from a CSF leak or meningitis. So I guess the important thing from our, from our trainees, we're not going to talk about classifications of cochlear dysplasia, but remember this particularly severe one, the IP1, um, with the empty cystic cochlea vestibule, there isn't an enlarged vestibular aqueduct like you get with the Mundini or the IP2, and a defect between the IAC and, and the cochlea. So this the leakage intermittently into the middle ear is the portal for 
infection and then the meningitis risk. They often have a profound hearing loss with the IP1 and hearing aids often aren't enough. And their implants for cochlear implants, which of course leads on to another whole list of potential complications. Um, but the, the tip for the trainees is suppose the pediatricians have a role in identifying a second bout of bacterial meningitis uh, in not letting them leave the hospital, full examination, calling ENT, I suppose, at an early stage. And we want to look at the newborn hearing screen. We want some ear-specific hearing assessment. We want good quality imaging of the temporal bone. And then hopefully the alarm bell will go off and you'll um, go after the leak and fix it. And arguably, the image I put up here was the CT at six months when the child came in with the first bout of meningitis. And in hindsight, of course, you can see the severe cochlear dysplasia on the left side, as Bill quite right, as Will quite rightly mentioned, with the wide oval window defect and the, the cystic um, cochlear vestibular malformation. So it would be nice to get it before the morbidity of the second severe meningitis. So uh, any oh. comments from the... <laughs> Panel. Adrian, you've had a couple of these cases, so you know all about it. But I was I like that little terminology of the cochlea seal and was delighted it was a fairly straightforward thing to, to fix. It's a good uh, good thing to be aware of, isn't it, about the risk of meningitis with these uh, anomalies. Uh, the, the one that I had, um, the mother made the diagnosis of CSF leak because she noticed when she lay her kid down on one side, water dripped out of the nose. And uh, she looked it up and tasted it, and it was salty. So she went to the doctor and said, "Oh, my kid's got a CSF leak." And uh, sure enough, uh, sure enough, they had. Wow. That's not the way it works in Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, the doctor said it was go away. It's just a cold, but she persisted. <laughs> okay. Luckily, yeah. Is anybody else jumping around like they're in a disco, or is it just my computer? No, it's just mine. Then that's fine. <laughs> Good. Jen, is, it, is that always, because there are right. different abnormalities that can occur, would that generally be the way to correct it by closing the oval window area or, or are there other sites that you might want to look at depending on the level of the abnormality? This seems to be the classic defect with IP1, looking back over the literature. Okay. Um, Adrian had a few of them. I think were your soul well, food plate had, related. Yeah, we, I think we had um, three and two children, um, and uh, the the one with the bilateral um, disorder had a cochlear implant on one side to try and get some hearing, but it didn't really work very well. I think the nerve was quite hypoplastic as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, if you read the books, there are things like Hertel's fissure and various obscure places where it seems like stuff can leak. Uh, I've not had experience of any other site of leak um, mm. than this, so, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. If, okay. if, if they've got a cochlear abnormality, it's most likely. If you look at, again, the books will say this is more common in boys, where you have a dehiscence at the, the lateral end of the, the IAC. Um, we've had a couple of bilaterals like this. Um, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. That, uh, yeah, that's the Phelps thing, isn't it? The type exactly. three, where you have quite a different appearance of the cockpit exactly. with no, um, uh, what would you call and, it? And the dialysis is completely missing. So, correct. Yeah. And 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 so, so we've had a couple of 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 uh, both boys and girls with um, uh, quite marked cochlear aplasia, who we've implanted, and and the issue has been that there's been very little mastoid, and also by putting an implant in, you create a, a CSF leak. And actually it's usually a gusher when you put it in, it actually starts to fill up. So um, with those, we, we, we've had one, we just had one or two, we've, um, and the one we've done recently, where we've done um, a blind sack closure on that side. And so you blind sack it, you block the eustachian tube, and then you implant um, to try and give them some hearing. And actually that's worked quite well. And so he's, he's got, he's actually got reasonable hearing on, on the side we've implanted and the other side where we're not going to rush into. Hmm. So, so the, so the option is blind sack. Okay. Right. That's fascinating, Keith. Um, it, it, I must say sticking a knife into the uh, oval window strikes me as being quite a hairy thing to do, but you clearly knew what you were doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, were you slightly anxious about it at the time, or were you pretty calm? Uh, I told you we used the phone a friend option. So I spoke yeah. to 
Blake and Adrian James, so they, they yeah. know about all these things. They told you what to do. You've seen them before. Uh, I, yeah, I'd heard about it from Brandon Isaacson in um, Dallas and Texas. So like you say, Keith, it's always good to phone a friend. Mm, yeah, mm. that's excellent. Uh, and basically, our, it's, only a, a very, so it's only a very brief introduction, really explaining uh, what it is, what the benefits might be, and then just a one very short uh, clip of video on, on tips for how to do it. Uh, and this uh, little video here, I think is perhaps the best way of showing how an endoscope is useful. If you want to take a picture of this tree, you don't hold your camera on the outside, you move your camera beyond the narrowest point so that with your uh, relatively wide angle lens, you get a good, a good view. And if you want to see around the corner, you don't make a hole in the wall, you, you change the angle of your camera. And this um, analogy, is very well suited to understanding why we use an endoscope uh, for ear surgery, because we can put the viewing lens beyond the narrow part and see well uh, from this uh, illustration from uh, Starabici. Now, there are some people who, who, who still don't really identify with these endoscopic advantages. Uh, this um, drawing is a modification of Tarabici's illustration by um, Mario Sanna's group, of the Gruppo Italiano, and uh, because they say, well, if you drill a bit of the bone away in the canal and move your microscope around, you can see just as well in the middle ear as if you use an endoscope. And to some extent, that's true, except you have to move your, end, your microscope around a lot to see. Uh, and, and if, but of course, it's not true if you want to see around the corner. You, 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 with an endoscope, you can see in here with an angled endoscope very effectively, but you can't with a microscope unless you do much more destructive surgery and remove more bone. Uh, I want at this point to emphasize that there are two different kinds of endoscope, uh, endoscopic ear surgery. And the first, which was really promoted by uh, Jean-Marc Thomason back in the 90s, is to put the endoscope in to have a look or to help you with um, parts of the surgery that are difficult with the microscope. So we could call that endoscope assisted surgery, but the um, enthusiasm over the, really over the last decade, uh, perhaps 20 years now, um, was um, promoted by people like Dave Pothier um, is, is in using the endoscope alone without a microscope for totally endoscopic ear surgery or transcanal endoscopic ear surgery. And uh, that's really what, uh, what I want to talk about. The way that um, I sort of first started to it was just like um, Susan was saying, actually, was just to have a look in difficult spaces. So before we had an endoscope, this is a, a second look in a, in a right ear with the tympanum meatal flap elevated. To look in the retro tympanum, you can put in a bit of saline and look in the meniscus. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of residual disease there uh, in the facial recess just here. But you can't see it very well. You certainly couldn't remove it with this technique. Uh, you can put in a mirror and again, you can see it pretty well, but it would be hard to remove um, without removing bone. And so the obvious thing to do is to put in an endoscope. This is a 30 degree endoscope. Now all of a sudden the facial recess isn't a recess at all. You can see it perfectly clearly and remove that disease um, um, in a quite effective manner. So that's what I started doing. And then uh, you realize that, well, why not do it um, for your dissection in the first place? These two bits of video from the same patient from a left ear uh, and on the left hand screen, you can't, this is the round window niche that you can just see and the tip of these curved instruments disappear out of view. This is the same dissector in the, uh, with the endoscopic view. The round window niche is now at the front of the field of view. We can see into the sinus tympani perfectly because it's quite a shallow one in this patient and peel the skin out to the sinus tympani and off the um, pyramid, the pyramidal eminence is here, the stapy superstructure is coming into view. We can do this under direct vision and know that we've not left any residual skin behind and so potentially reduce our risk of leaving residual disease. And then once you've figured out that you can do that through a post auricular incision, you realize, well, actually, you can do it through the ear canal without making an incision at all. But the, so there's a lot of enthusiasm. But interestingly, if you look critically at the results that have been published, and I'm mentioning so, you know, I, these are the, the, my data that, that, that are available, uh, but there are meta-analyses now of looking at um, several studies in children as well as adults. You'll see that actually the results aren't that dramatically different. Repairing a perforation is the same, whether you do it totally endoscopically or through a post-auricular incision. 
Um, results from torpor cycloplasty are the same in terms of hearing outcomes. Um, when we compare um, endoscope with not using an endoscope, we do get less residual clastitoma in the middle ear space, uh, but um, overall, that's not a very strong effect. It's a very small difference. Uh, and uh, when we compare totally endoscopic ear surgery with endoscope assisted surgery, there's no difference in residual cholesteatoma. So you kind of look at this and you think, well, what's the point if, if the results are the same? Why would I struggle and try and do surgery endoscopically? Um, and this is the answer. It's because by doing surgery endoscopically through the ear canal, there's less morbidity for the child. And first of all, if we think about wound complications, they're pretty rare, aren't they? You know, we all know a surgeon sort of post auricular incision heals up pretty well and is actually, from a surgeon's perspective, a pretty trivial uh, intervention. But a proportion do get complications. And here we see a, a seroma, uh, a wound dehiscence from an abscess that's now starting to heal up, and a wound dehiscence caused by um, another kid in the playground pulling on the kid's ear because he thought it would be funny after surgery. Those are some examples. And in my practice, it works out about, about one in 25 or so end up with some sort of wound problem. When people put the incision in a visible place, and particularly when they use interrupted sutures like has been done here and, and here, you can, the scar is visible. I don't really think, well, I think it's entirely unacceptable to use interrupted sutures and cause that kind of scarring. Much better to use an in, uh, a subcuticular suture and preferably one that dissolves so you don't have to remove it. Uh, and I personally would hide it more in the posterior sulcus so you don't end up with this Un unsightly scar tissue. But um, sure, we can, we can avoid that scar by hiding the incision a bit better. But the bigger issue is this, is occasionally you get a patient with a keloid. Uh, here there's another complication of a, poster, um, a fistula into the mastoid after infection. And I can tell you, don't, this, this kid here had bilateral tympanoplasties with a posterior approach. Uh, and uh, you could imagine the uh, effect on quality of life that this awful um, complication had for him. We're taught that it's um, people of um, particularly of African descent that are particularly at risk of keloids, but this guy was from Sri Lanka. Uh, this one I, I can't remember, but looks pretty Caucasian. I think this kid was um, from the Middle East. I think this kid might have been from Sri Lanka as well. And this child was from, uh, from China originally. So um, it's not necessarily, you can't necessarily predict who's going to get a keloid. Uh, and if you could avoid it, well, of course you would. There are some other advantages. Surgery um, ends up being quicker once you've got figured out how to do it uh, because you don't have to spend the time closing the incision. Uh, there's less pain afterwards. That's been shown in a few studies now. The length of stay is shorter because of these two things. But ultimately, uh, the main driver for me has been parental preference. Um, it, it always struck me in the early days how pleased parents were when they heard that I'd been able to do the surgery without making an incision. And I was kind of a bit mystified because like I said to us as surgeons, uh, making a little cut behind the ear doesn't really seem like a big deal, uh, but for the families it, it clearly was. The reason, so, so then the question is, well, you know, why, why would you make an incision if you don't need to? And I think the reason for most people is because uh, it can be quite difficult figuring out how to do surgery with one hand, uh, but with um, patience and practice and attending courses like Mike was alluding to, uh, you can learn tips that make it easier. And I just wanted to show this one uh, video clip here about how um, you can do a lot of the functions that you'd normally do with two hands with one hand. So this is a, a curved suction dissector you can see that we can dissect um, without retraction if we want to, but if we rotate the instrument a little bit, we can retract so we can see better. The sharp tip allows us to cut through that little strand of tissue there. And all the time we're aspirating blood so that we're maintaining a good view. And then uh, with practice, you kind of get used to the idea that you can retract like this just by rotating the instrument a little bit. And that kind of keeps the tissue under tension so that when you're dissecting, uh, you're able to, well, so you're able to dissect uh, by doing all these things at the same time. And it does take a while to get the hang of this sort of thing. It helps if you have um, specialist instruments like suction dissectors, 
uh, but it's certainly possible to do it, uh, to do the surgery with one hand like that. One handed is in inverted commas because you may have noticed the endoscope was moving around all the time. Uh, we don't use an endoscope holder because we need dynamic um, positioning of the endoscope to see, uh, to optimize our view. So uh, it's only a quick um, summary really, but I think the main advantage of doing surgery totally endoscopically is it from the family's perspective, it's incisionless surgery, which they like. Uh, for cholesteatoma, perforation, repair, and vesicloplasty, the results are at least as good as doing it through a, a more invasive approach. And we do have that advantage that the morbidity is less. Uh, so that's why I would encourage you to uh, you know, consider this option and to, uh, to work at it. So Mike, I did have a case to present, but I think it's very similar to the sort of things that uh, okay. we were talking about uh, with Wells. So that's, Adrian, that's fantastic. Um, so when I came back from the course, I uh, went through a spell of doing endoscopic moringoplasties, and I, I did a fair bit of it, and I even did a little atticotomy with cartilage graft, and uh, you know me and my images and photos, I love that sort of thing, so it suited me down to the ground. But when, when the two departments merged, there were a lot more otologists and um, I, I, I you know, basically stopped doing it. But I, I thought it was a fascinating subject. I don't know, Susan, are you, are you doing anything endoscopically or are you sort of doing it endoscopic assisted? So, so I think, so in fact, after I went to Baco and saw quite a few of, so did some, I did a, the course in Harvard actually, mm, uh, yeah, because it's course, endoscopic yeah. sinus and um, an ear surgery. So I did that one, and then um, that talks a lot about your positioning. So having the screen in front of you as opposed to on the side sitting. Um, so I found that that's quite useful. So I'll do a myringoplasty endoscopically, and I use it a lot in terms of doing mastoid surgery. I think, and this was part of my question for Adrian is, would you do cholesterol surgery completely endoscopically in a child, particularly if you're doing a canal wall up? I'm not quite clear on how I how I do that without doing an incision. But the smaller procedures, yes, I would yeah. do. Yeah. So I think so. You can imagine um, if you picture a small congenital cholestatoma in the antero superior quadrant, or even in the postero superior quadrant, you could imagine how an endoscopic approach would be well suited to that because it would help yes. you to see into the area where it is. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, and then also, if you imagine disease, we don't see this very often in children, but disease confined to the lateral part of the attic, as Mike's saying, you, know, you can do a, a simple atticotomy. Yeah. With a curette, you can remove the bone quite easily uh, with, to, yeah. to remove the sputum. And so those, those would be the first step. Um, ultimately, um, you know, if you, you carry on, you, you have experience of doing that, you go a bit further. I think the limit for, for most people uh, is somewhere around the lateral semicircular canal, maybe the apex of the lateral canal or a bit behind that, because mm -hmm. in order to get any further back into the, toward the sinodural angle, you have to remove so much bone from the canal wall, you're virtually doing a, um, well, you're doing a front to back mastoidectomy and then you've got a big defect to repair. And in the point I always like to make is that in children, if you're using tragal cartilage to repair the uh, canal wall, uh, well, in a young child, the tragal cartilage isn't that big, and so you might not have enough to repair the size of defect that you've made. So, right. it, uh, especially if you need to repair the eardrum with cartilage as well, um, that there isn't going to be enough. So, you have to think about not just how extensive the disease is, um, whether you can reach it through the canal, but also how you're going to reconstruct it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Keith, yeah. Do, you, uh, do you use endoscopes a lot? Yeah, uh, but assisted, yeah, for cholesterol. I haven't used the Buckingham mirror for twelve years. Yeah. But uh, yes, I'm st I'm starting to use. It. I think it. I think it's good. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And Will, how about how about Southampton? So mix. Um, for certain things, the endoscope's great. Um, so if you're doing, as Adrian says, if you've got a congenital cholesterol, anterior superior, middle ear work going in and looking around, size templi, fantastic. So, so very much, I, I don't do much pure endoscopic surgery, um, but I think that actually you, you can mix both microscope and endoscopic together and it works very well. So I, I think it's a great, it's a great innovation. Yeah. 
Yeah, my, my experience was that it was a lot of, it was quite faffy to start with, get to the graft and then get to the graft in was. And then when you put the flap down, that was the operation over. You just put a little pack in and that was the really nice bit because suddenly you were done without having to stitch anything up. And, and actually the post-op morbidity and pain is really low, as you mentioned earlier. So it's quite an attractive thing. I think it is quite true that parents love it. Mm. You know, yeah. they, they love the idea of no incision. So. Yeah, increasingly people are sort of worried about cosmesis and incision and scars, aren't they? Uh, any studies regarding doing endoscopic stapedectomy? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, there are actually, yeah. So, of course, in, um, in children, it's very rare that we would consider doing that procedure. Um, the risks of a dead ear um, doing stapedectomy on a congenitally abnormal uh, stapes is thought to be around um, 3%, so in other words, 1 in 30. Uh, and that's of published results. You can imagine that a lot of people are a bit shy about publishing their bad results, so maybe it's even higher than that. So in our practice, we tend not to operate on congenitally abnormal stapes, and, and we don't really see otosclerosis in children. Although it's reported, we haven't seen it. Uh, so, um, so I don't have any experience, but it's definitely uh, reported in adults. And there's some debate really amongst adult otologists, I would say, as to how helpful people find it. But there are some um, strong advocates who are capable of doing endoscopic and microscope uh, guided surgery who strongly prefer to do it with an endoscope. I think results are fairly equivalent though. Mm. I must say, uh, my personal view on that, Adrian, is that uh, uh, the best treatment for otosclerosis is a Baja. But <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it also depends upon your learning curve. Yeah. I think that actually, yeah. if you've done microscopic uh, two-handed stapedectomy for a prolonged period of time, and you've got over your learning curve and you're on your plateau, then mm -hmm. there should be no reason to change. Because to go back you are going to have a learning curve and you will have morbidity. Um, if, however, you're starting out and as a registrar, you have access to uh, uh, consultants who can, will do both, then you can choose. And, and I think a lot of these things don't come down to technique. They come down to your own personal results. If your personal results, and this is why you need personal audit, if your personal results are up with either technique then that's fine. Um, but you do need to audit whatever you do to decide what to decide what's best. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, and Dave Pothier was always mortified when people were rushing in, to, you know, they do a, a course and then they go home and do an endoscopic stapedotomy. He was always uh, um, frightened that that was going to give endoscopic ear surgery a bad name because people would go home and get complications. So I think everybody would argue that um, stapy surgery is not how you start doing endoscopic ear surgery. Start on easy tympanoplasties and, and get experience before you consider doing stapies. Okay, that's, that's Adrian, it's, it is fantastic. And it's very nice to see that, uh, that, that that's actually progressing as, as time's going on. So thank you very much to everybody. Night-night. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Bye. Bye. Bye.